Obviously, we're here to announce the um, soon publication, the imminent publication, not quite like the second coming of Christ, okay, of, of the Net Bible. And so I want to introduce a panelist that I'll be interviewing. Uh, first, Nikki Getman, who's Senior Marketing Director at Thomas Nelson. And then uh, Hall Harris, Senior Professor of New Testament Studies here at Dallas Theological Seminary. Dorian Coover Cox, Professor of Old Testament Studies. Robert Chisholm, Department Chair and Senior Professor of Old Testament Studies. And then Dan, so you would have a choice. Uh, Dan Wallace, Senior Research Professor of New Testament Studies. Uh, and uh, these are all people who worked on the translation. We also have with us people who worked on this translation, and I'm not going to uh, call them out by name, but if you worked on the net translation and you are here, would you please stand? Go ahead. Now, translations are interesting things, and sometimes they actually are controversial things. So, um, so the first thing I want to do is I want to ask Nikki, um, why was Thomas Nelson interested in uh, publishing another Bible? After all, it isn't like we don't have all kinds of English Bibles out there. Well, I think that's true, and, and I answer this question on the regular because... Um, uh, why another English translation? Why do we need another English translation? And of course, Nelson has been publishing English Bibles since uh, 1798. So we have a long history <laughs> and uh, with Bible, Bible publishing, but this one is different. Um, the NET allows you, no matter which translation you're reading, to really uh, understand why the translators um, all the way back through the centuries, are we okay down there? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, uh, that's okay. Sorry, Yuki, I No, no worries. Um, why the translators through the centuries have made the choices that they've made. And I think that that's a really significant uh, com uh, contribution to uh, biblical literacy, biblical understanding, and, um, and Bible publishing as a whole. It's something that's never been done, and we are thrilled um, to be representing this Bible and be um, doing this well, for the church. Great. Hall, um, we heard a little bit of, of what you thought about the translation. Talk about the challenge of translations, um, because you've spent how many hours working on the Net Bible? Can you count <laughs> up the number of hours that you have spent? Uh, and you're not getting paid by the hour, are you? Yeah, no. <laughs> Let's not even go into that. Uh, um, uh, probably Ursula could count. My wife is here, Ursula. She, better than I, knows, and our kids know, how many hours it took. But I quit counting when I passed 12,000 hours pro bono. Um, and I have two words to describe my experience as project director and managing editor of this whole thing for going on now, what, 24 years? Mm -hmm. um, herding cats. <laughs> <laughs> if any of you have seen the famous EDS cat herding commercial, uh, it's on YouTube, you can find it. It's a classic and that's the experience I've had. So anyway, too many moving parts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But uh, I think the challenge was worth it because I've always believed that you can't really have too much information about the Bible and what goes into the Bible and what's behind the Bible. We live in a culture that's very different from first century or even second millennium BC culture. And anything we can do to bridge that cultural gap, I think, is helpful to the reading and understanding of scripture. Otherwise, if we don't look at it and understand it first in its historical setting and context, and then go on to ask the question, how is that relevant for the church today? All we're really doing is 
using a magical book of incantations. We just flip it open, put down our finger, and that's our verse for the day. Um, no, I don't think so. We're all better than that, especially at Dallas Seminary, for goodness sakes. So that's my initial take. And Dorian, uh, this is not the only translation you work on, is that correct? That's correct. So you also work with? The uh, Christian Standard Bible. Okay. That's published by uh, Bridman and Holman. Okay. And can you talk a little bit about, uh, about um, the differences between translations? We heard the word literal and dynamic. Why don't you help us sort through what, what we're talking about when we raise that question? When you start with a source language, you look at it and you're saying, okay, what is this talking about? What is it saying? How is it saying it? Now, how do I bring as much of that into English as I can? And every, every translator has to make those decisions according to the target audience. So who's going to be reading this? Will they understand it well if I say it this way versus that way? And in, in working with a committee on various choices, each person brings, uh, brings insight into that choice so that you're working to get as much as possible the clo a close yet understanding understandable presentation of what you know to be there in the source language. And so any of you who, who are working between languages know that you can get information from one language into another. That's not the problem. The problem is how how much of the emotion comes through, how much of the wordplay comes through, and other similar things. And then, and what do you do with figures of speech that aren't the same in both languages? And so I, I don't anymore really like the term literal <laughs> because often, it seems to me, the what is offered as a literal translation is simply the first translation value in the dictionary for each word, <laughs> rather than um, anything that actually conveys the thought that's there. So I don't know, does that help? A yeah, bit? so if you stick together a couple of pieces next to one another, it doesn't mean you've connected the puzzle. Is that kind of what you're saying? I think that's a good way to put it. You, <laughs> you, um, I sometimes I talk to people in class and I say, okay, you've gotten a meaning for each of the words, but it still isn't English. <laughs> <laughs> it still isn't English because no one would understand it. No one would say it that way. So it's always an effort for and and a good one to be involved in. So to, to even take have a chance to be involved in in these two projects has been a great joy. And when you talk about a committee, a committee, most translations have committee work associated with them. There's a group that discusses which rendering out of several oftentimes good possibilities do we regard as the best. Is that, is that what goes on in committee? Yeah. And, and usually, even with a committee situation, so far as I understand it, uh, and as it was with NetBible, there would be an initial translator, someone who provides the first draft, so to speak. And then people look at it and think about it. And so the notes, and, and one of the things that I did for um, portions of NetBible was to come along after a, the initial translation had been made and the initial notes had been offered and simply go through them and say, okay, does this, does this make sense to me? Um, is there a mistake of any sort here? What, it, can, it, how, can this be improved? Uh, is the punctuation correct? Uh, that there are, if a, human, if a human being touches it, there could be a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> 
Robert, uh, I actually don't know the answer to this question. Have you worked on any other translations besides the, the Net Bible? Yes, many. <laughs> Study Bibles, <laughs> translations. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't have my resume with me. <laughs> it's, it's that many, so I mean, I can't remember. Google yeah, me. It's been, Google me. You'll it's been so. It's, it, uh, um, yeah, several. It's, yeah, I, I, the, I think the first one I was involved in was the international children's version. Yeah, which is very interesting. It had a limited number, only so many words per mm -hmm. sentence, and words had to be short. It was an interesting. Another Thomas Nelson contribution, oh, by yeah. the way. So. And then so many people liked it, but they didn't want to keep calling it the children's Bible. So I think we called it the New Century version, which that was the children's Bible for adults. <laughs> <laughs> Those who were headed yeah, yeah. to the age of a century. Yeah, 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 yeah. So. <laughs> mm -hmm. So yeah, I've worked on quite a few. And so so what do you find what do you find unique about the Net Bible given the fact that you've worked on several translations? Well, the notes. Mm -hmm. the, the beauty of the Net Bible is you can actually try to bring out what the text is saying and not feel like you're over interpreting because you can put the literal translation in the bottom and the more literal translation word for word. You've got that there and then you can talk about options. And many times we would give other possible translations, if you went with interpretation A, here's the way you'd translate it. Interpretation B, this is the way you'd go. But you have to choose one for the text. You can't just put dot, dot, dot when you come to a difficult verse. <laughs> um, like, you know, you're tempted to do like in Hosea 11. I, I wrote a piece on Hosea 11 recently, and uh, I didn't need to worry about it being an official translation. It was just my translation for the sake of the study. And I had several dot, dot, dot places because I wanted to communicate. Nobody really knows what this is saying. <laughs> but, so... Uh, yeah, that was, the, that was the great thing about NET. It just freed you up to uh, uh, include all the options, and yeah, I liked that. Dan, I, I take it you've worked on several translations as well. Yeah, Google me. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are really helpful. I just want you to know that. Uh, uh, I'm on the uh, Committee on Bible Translation for the NIV mm -hmm. right now, too. Yeah. So, um, I mean, if uh, what you don't know, or what I'm trying to make clear is, is that between all of us, there's almost, I will almost say there's very few English translations that at least one of us has not worked on. Um, uh, uh, I did background work for the ESV, uh, did work on the NLT. So, um, so we're talking about people who are valuing this translation because we know what it is to work with others. What do you see as the, uh, kind of the same question I asked Hall, very, what do you see as the challenge for a Bible translator? What do you think people don't appreciate about what happens when a translation gets produced? Bruce Waltke uh, told me this summer that with all the sexual innuendos that are going on in the English language, he fears that someday we can't even translate the Bible anymore. It was, uh, it, that was probably the biggest challenge to me is when you translate the text a certain way, you want to get rid of what Wayne Groom calls the junior high snicker effect. Uh, you don't want to have something that sounds uh, lewd. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Now, Bob, you're from you're from New York. You normally just speak up. What's going on here? Translators uh, workshop uh, discussion. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, Bruce uh, Metzger uh, mentioned when he was working on the NRSV that they had to change the RSV in one place where God says, "I will accept no bowl from your house," mm -hmm. and he said that that really comes across in a little different way than uh, what we want it to mean today. Some of you are too sheltered to even know what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, and the point that you're making is, is that um, you have to think through not only what the text means, but even how it will be perceived and heard once it's rendered into English. That that's right. the challenge in the target language side. Right. And one of the things that we had as a goal was to make this a literary production, not a literal production. And the more literal we could put in the footnotes, but we wanted it to be good, uh, understated, elegant English. And I think that we've achieved that uh, to some degree, 
Hall needs to do more work, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, only it, twelve thousand hours. Come on, get to work, man. <laughs> it, uh, it it is a, it is a challenge to think through how something communicates, and sometimes a translator is wrestling with. Uh, the implications of what something is said, particularly with figures of speech and that kind of thing, as opposed to rendering it literally, et cetera. So this discussion that we see generally in public about translations and whether they're more literal or more dynamic is actually wrestling with a very real problem in translation, isn't it? Right, and there's some issues that you think, do I leave this in the idiom of the original language or do I convert it? Now, one of the problems when you convert it in uh, so many of these idioms into uh, modern English where you get rid of the, the figurative language is uh, you also lose some of the powerful connotations, as Dorian was suggesting, that we want the reader to feel the same way as the original readers did. We had uh, a field translator uh, wrote, who wrote to us and he said, uh, when you translate en Christo, in Christ, that doesn't really communicate very much in English to the modern reader, so you need to change it to something different every single time. And our response was, well, it actually didn't mean very much to the ancient Greek reader either. <laughs> it was, you, you don't have the sense of people who are somehow in another person who, especially somebody who's already dead. So what does this mean? It means that he's got the life that is the eschatological life. It goes far beyond what we are experiencing now. And so what Paul comes up with when he invents that phrase is a metaphorical image that uh, we have yet to plumb the depths of. And it's something that we still have to wrestle with today. So I think there's places like that that if it communicates the same to the English reader as it did to the Greek or the Hebrew reader, we want to keep that. Now, uh, up on the screen, just a second, Robert, let me just point out. Up on the screen, you see a number. Uh, we're going to be taking questions from the floor, but we're going to ask you to send them to us uh, digitally. So um, I've got my little iPhone here, and those questions are popping up. So do feel free, if you have a question, to send those in. Go ahead, Bob. What were you going to raise? Yeah, I have a good example from Old Testament on this. In Psalms, the Lord is called a sewer. Rock is the way it gets translated. So what do you do with that? Uh, what does that mean? God is a rock, oh, something I pick up and throw at somebody, uh, an obstacle in the way. I mean, it, usage suggests that he has in mind a rocky cliff terrain where he can go that will be relatively inaccessible and he'll be safe. Uh, so if you translate rock, you have no idea how a person is going to take that. So we decided to just go with protector because that's the idea, because we're not in a position to appreciate the metaphor. Now, shield, we were able to retain that one more literally because everybody knows what a shield is and what its function is. But with uh, sewer, rock, we had to fudge. And you do lose something. You, you lose the, uh, the metaphor. You lose the power. Yeah, you, you explain this in the footnotes, and that's one of the great things about the Net Bible. Yeah. So we could have gone rock with the translation and I suppose put it in the footnotes, but I didn't, you know, you don't trust everybody to read the footnotes. <laughs> do you have experience with that? <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> Paul, you're going to raise, you're going to... Well, I was also going to add that there have been many layers of editorial work gone into this. <laughs> <clears throat> and some of those places may actually have reverted to the more literal imagery. I'm just giving you a heads up, Bob. Uh, <laughs> because... This is actually a stealth I, I wasn't. <laughs> I wasn't one of the culprits on that. Uh, oh, no, I'm not accusing yeah. you of being the culprit. Okay, I'm warning ahead. you of being the victim of the culprit. <laughs> All right. All right. Can, can um, we, can, in, do we have enough time? It won't take more than 30 seconds to go ahead. tell them the classic example. Okay, go, ahead, go ahead. If you know Gordon Johnston, is Gordon oh. here? Lots of things are going on in Gordon's mind all at once. <laughs> he, he can double and triple task. But one day he was working, he was translating in a passage in Proverbs on the wayward woman. And he got a phone call from his bank and he had one of those note things on his computer and he put the number down that he needed to call back to the bank. And 
uh, well, somehow, some way, you know, it's like stay away from the wayward woman there in Proverbs, and then there's a number in the book. <laughs> That's almost as famous as one of the versions, I think it is, of the King James that left out the knot on one of the oh, Ten Commandments. Yeah, the <laughs> yeah. Thou right. shalt the commit wicked adultery. Bible. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, anyway. Uh, let me, let me, well, let me add to that because I think <laughs> in, in, in Gordon's defense, since he's not here to defend himself, uh, I might also add that we had other translators who were really fond of using a particular five-letter word for spoils of war. They wanted <laughs> David's men to grab the booty. <laughs> um, Since you brought that up, how about, you know, uh, we didn't do that. <laughs> but I think one of the other English translations, you know, they, they wrapped Samson up in fresh thongs. Uh, <laughs> okay, yeah. all right. Uh, <laughs> we changed <laughs> Yes, and I would also add that the latest revision of the NIV took our translation and now uses it. So we've actually influenced others. Daryl, I could add a few others. But I, I, would, I would prefer to keep this PG-13. That's exactly right. Now, let me, let me ask you. This is actually a serious question that's coming uh, through on the questions. Uh, uh, I should have known not to put this group together. Um, you see uh, what I mean about cat herding? Yeah, exactly right. By the way, yeah. <laughs> one time publicly, it was at one of these five-year things where they honor us, Buse Fanning in public said that Hall deserves a medal because he oversaw a project that had Dan and me in it and survived, and the project actually was a success. Actually, I think that's up for grabs, but anyway. <laughs> Uh, so let me let me ask you a serious let me try and inject a serious question in here. Um, how do you how do you deal with the issue of personal biases that affect your translation skills, and how do you combat bias? Um, and I'll let that's for anybody who's who wants to take that one on. Uh, how do you how do you check that tendency? I think you do it by the editorial committee. Mm -hmm. It's not a, a single translator who's doing this work. But the Net Bible does something that's unique. It's the only Bible that's ever been beta tested on the internet. And so not only do the editor editorial committee look over something and wrestle with it from different uh, perspectives, but we also put that translation out there. We did that before it was ever actually published. And Hall, I think you said we got over a million comments that came in? Something like, something like that, yeah. And it went through two beta editions before the yeah. first edition was published. And we're still taking comments today. Um, because one point I want to add to this whole discussion, I'm not sure you can always deal with your own bias. I think you need other people to point out your biases for you. And that's the value of putting this out there in preliminary form and letting people send in their comments and having us right. adjust as needed. Yeah, and I, I think that, uh, I actually think the timing of when this project began is important because it was the reality of the digital world that allowed us to conceive of what this would be. That, uh, um, that up to that, the, this project was really launched in the time when, when uh, the digital revolution was just getting started in many ways and it was being applied to biblical studies. And all of a sudden you realized you had all this space and capability online, because this was originally an online Bible, online that you didn't have by the limits of a page. And what's amazing about this particular version is, is that we've kind of done it in reverse. We took the digital side of what was an open-ended possibility and have tried to move it into the confines of a, of a set page you know, with the layout, that's why, I, the reason I ran the video about the, um, about the typographer was because he was faced with a really interesting challenge. How do you take these notes and wrap them around the text? Now when you see the result 
uh, it's interesting because I'm reminded of, uh, of texts of the Mishnah and Talmud and that kind of thing that you often see uh, where there's a similar solution that actually looks so similar that we can say that even though this is new, it actually has quite an old tradition even behind it. Even medieval Greek New Testament manuscripts with commentary do something very similar. Yeah, so, it, so in that sense, it's, uh, you, you've, <laughs> you're kind of back to the future in terms of the, uh, the way in which uh, the volume uh, operates. Let me, give you, let me give you another question. Um, it, it says, English translations have been around for a long time. Only recently in my lifetime have there been notes to say that there are alternate readings of the verse. The net would seem to be an academic admission of humility. On the other hand, couldn't a skeptic use it to argue, see, nobody really knows what the Bible actually says anyway. You can translate it any way you want. So that is a, Hall, you, your hand went right up. <laughs> yeah, it did. I, um, I want to point out that the editions of the King James Bible printed before 1640 actually had marginal notes. And uh, they were by royal decree, King James himself, uh, they could not be theological notes like the Geneva Bible had had, because that was rife with uh, Calvinism. Um, and but, the king on the king. Right, but, which he didn't care for. But <laughs> they, were able, they were allowed to give variant meanings for words and alternate translations. And I have several pages of some of those Bibles, one of which is in the wall of my office, I'll be glad to show anybody, where you can see the notes. Uh, of both the Geneva and the King James. So no, it's not a new thing, actually. There were 8,000 notes in the original King James, and uh, they're not printed much anymore. So we have this false sense of assurance based on the printing press, but not on the reality. And so when we have these English translations that vary from one another, people think, well, why don't we just use one? Well, before the printing press, you couldn't use just one. Manuscripts all differ. And so each Christian has a responsibility to, to know God as well as they can. And with the Net Bible, they have now an opportunity to compare that with their favorite translation and see why they think that's really good. So Dan, how, how is this not a variation of the question that often comes up with regard to manuscripts versus translations, which is, um, we have so many differences between the manuscripts and differences of meaning. Uh, doesn't that render uh, uncertain uh, what the Bible teaches. And uh, to me, it seems like this is an analogous kind of question. Um, and what's the normal response to that kind of a question? Well, certainly there are going to be some areas where we're not exactly sure what the Bible either says or what it means. But those are on the margins. They're on the periphery. Uh, I can give the illustration of uh, textual variants among the manuscripts. Among Greek New Testament manuscripts, there's not a single viable variant that affects any cardinal doctrine. And a number of scholars would say there's not a single viable variant that affects any doctrine, whether it's cardinal or even of uh, minor significance. I can think of, of one that may affect orthopraxy, not orthodoxy. Mark 9.29, after uh, the disciples tried to cast out a particularly pesky demon and, and failed at that, they came to Jesus and he said, this kind can only be cast out by prayer or he might have added the words, and fasting. Now, later manuscripts have, and fasting. The earlier ones have just prayer. When I do exorcisms, I kind of hedge my bet. I'm not sure which one it is. So, <laughs> so I pray and fast. But as you can tell just by looking at me, I, I go with a shorter reading most of the time. <laughs> And, and so the issue becomes, the, the issue becomes uh, keeping this group organized is a problem. Um, uh, Herding cats. Yeah, exactly right. Um, so the issue becomes not so much does the Bible teach X as how many passages affirm this X that is being taught by the Bible. Is that, is that pretty much what you're saying? One yes. Thing, Go ahead, Dorian. Well, one thing that I think I might like to add is that if you observe authors commonly, and even yourself when you're talking, if it's something important, you tend to say it more than once and in more than one way. And I find that to be true of scripture as well. So uh, 
you, I, I just, I look around and I say, well, if this is important, it's going to be emphasized in more than one way, and, and I can see it if I look, if I'm watching it. And so the, so the meaning is layered, I, like, I think. You, you, you can see it being built and polished and built and polished so that there's, uh, there is a strong sense of what's going on and of what happened and, and where, there, where, where Dr. Chisholm's dot, dot, dot is concerned, he still knows what the book is saying. And I usually know what the options are. I just don't know which one to choose. So you know, I don't want to be arbitrary. And the beauty of the notes is, is that it lets you know what right. your options are. I mean, it, 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 you can say it, the text either means what's up here at the top, or there's a text down here that uh, also might explain uh, what's going on as well with, with, with the passage. Let me, let me uh, raise another question here. Um, this is an interesting one. Um, do you have any expectations, or is there any history, let me, I'll add to the question, regarding the impact of the net to international translators and pastors? I mean, this is an English translation. It's circulated digitally. It certainly has been read by people globally. Um, do we have any sense as to what the impact of the translation uh, has been and, and could be in terms of international concerns? All translators, I suspect, I don't know them all, but because English translations are widely available digitally, translators can look at what others have done. And, we, and all of them benefit from the work that others have done. And when, um, when a Bible translator who's going into a new language, the task initially is to figure out, OK, what is this new language? How do how do I understand it? And then how can I how can I get scripture into this language? And to have the notes from Net Bible explaining the options then makes it easier for them to to ask questions of their informants and to to try different ways of saying it so that they can get the aha moment where the, the informant says, yeah, that's what it is. That's it, that's it, I understand now. And there, uh, what people may not be aware of is the American Bible Society used to produce a series of notes on each book called the translator's notes on and then whatever the book is. And um, really they are uh, very similar to the types of notes that you see in the net in terms of helping someone come to grips with uh, what contextually are the options here. And in, in some cases, this is why this has been opted for in relationship to the other alternative or alternatives that you, that you see. <laughs> oh. uh, just to add a quick note, because I know we're running on time here, um, part of related to the publication of the net Bible in English, Another project tied closely to it, <clears throat> also sponsored by HarperCollins, Thomas Nelson, is to translate the, net, the English Net Bible plus the notes into the top tier 40, 40 or 44 languages uh, around the world. Um, and Yes, I know, translations of translations don't do well, but we're looking primarily at the value of the notes to people in those other uh, language groups. And we're also faced with a terribly daunting task of trying to render those notes culturally understandable to those other languages. So if any of you out there come from different language backgrounds, and especially with translation experience, you should get in touch with us. And uh, let's talk about even draft translations to help start would be useful, or reviewing other people's translations would be useful. So there's plenty of room here for involvement on the part of any of you. I, I know some of you actually are in translation. I have some in my class this semester. so. 
It's just a quick footnote. Well, this is why we're deeply, this is one of the reasons we're deeply committed to teaching the languages here at Dallas Seminary. We think that an accurate rendering of the Word of God is extremely culturally important and relevant. Uh, we think that uh, giving that deep thought in terms of, uh, of how the Bible is understood by people reading it who may not have a theological background is very important, and translation is a great bridge to get there. So uh, we, uh, we should thank our panelists for taking the time to explain them what Bible it is. I'll close us in a word of prayer, and then we're going to run a video that you're welcome to hang around and watch that tells you a little more. So let me, let me pray. Father, we do thank you for your goodness and grace that you speak. That you speak to us about why you made us, um, the way in which you have gifted us, the opportunities that we have to draw close to you. And that the Word of God is, uh, is a way of your keeping us close. Our prayer is, is that this translation and other translations that are faithful to the Word of God would accomplish that purpose. We know that your Word does not come back void. Our prayer is not so much for the Word, which doesn't come back void, but it is for us. That we would heed what it says. That we would sense the embrace that it represents and that we would be drawn closer to you by your spirit through your, the work of your son to you as we reflect on what it is to be men and women of God. And we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.